Good morning and good afternoon to, to everybody. Thank you so much for attending this webinar. And in particular, I want to thank um, Paula Krantz, our first guest. Paula is from Novant Health. Paula is both Vice President of Innovation Enablement and the Founding Executive Director of the Novant Health Innovation Labs. She's also the CEO and founder of MediXR, a global healthcare consulting firm specializing in innovation and digital transformation. And before entering healthcare, Paula had an impressive career as a US intelligence officer working in electronic war warfare, all source intelligence data analytics, NATO intelligence units, interagency FBI, joint terrorism task force and US special operations command. She's also a New, New York Times bestselling author, Paula, you're very, very welcome indeed. <laughs> Thank you, Alison. Great to be here. I mean, that, that is just some, and that is that is the condensed version of your career, Paula. Um, I'm so intrigued to ask you, um, are there ways in which uh, a, a military and intelligence training um, help you in healthcare? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, part of what we do as intelligence officers is winning hearts and minds, right? And so you've got to find the problem that's causing the pain point, um, and that takes trust building with, with stakeholders, whether it's a, you know, an, an emigre I'm trying to gather information from, or in, in the workforce, you know, I'm not, I don't have a healthcare background. So being able to build rapport with healthcare workers and get them to mm -hmm. talk about their biggest frustrations and challenges so that we can do the solutioning to um, create a, a new way forward. Um, it's very similar. Yeah. It's, I uh, love that. It's, I, it's so similar. It's, it's so true. When you get down to the, to the essence of things, we're all humans and healthcare is of course, and, and naturally the military as well. It's really about kind of the, the human condition and, um, uh, you know, never more so than in healthcare. But I also think great innovation comes from the intersection of, two fields right you can take the you know the knowledge from from one seemingly unrelated field and applying it to the other and that this is where great things happen um i'm so could you tell us a little bit about the innovation lab and its mission absolutely um well we opened the uh, novant health innovation first lab in charlotte in april of this year and um, we plan to open labs in Wilmington and Winston-Salem. Um, Novant Health, just for some context, has a four-state footprint. We have about 40,000 employees. Uh, we have about 5 million patient touch points per year. And um, we have 600 clinics and 18 large hospitals. So we have a lot of uh, constituents and stakeholders in that footprint, as, as you can imagine. Um, I technically fall under the digital products and services team, which is ostensibly IT. And my uh, direct supervisor is our chief transformation and digital officer. And she has created this space for me and my team now to imagine the world of possibilities. Um, she's protected us in these times when healthcare companies are so strained, most are in a deficit. There is not a lot of um, margin for, for error or for you know, any kind of superfluous spending, if you will. So she's created this space for us to still continue moving innovation forward. Um, and we don't use operational dollars to do that. We raise it money th through donors or um, through grants. So through those donors dollars and grants, we've been able to launch a couple of programs. And those programs support 3D printing as well as a virtual and augmented reality. Um, mm -hmm. Your team has been to our lab and we have different exhibits rotating through. So we might have an exhibit that focuses on innovation in mental health or innovation in the acute care space and so forth. So um, the space is experiential. Um, it's meaningful for our, our workforce, but also for the community and for the next generation of workers. Um, and we hope to replicate that in those, in those other uh, physical locations across the state. So that's what I was gonna kind of dig in there a little bit about, like what are your sort of operating principles? Like how do you do innovation? As you know, there's like, there's so much happening in healthcare and there are such incredible innovations happening. How do you go about um, evaluating um, all of these things? Are there are there principles or core kind of efficiencies that you guys are, are focused on at the moment? Could you sh share a little bit about that? Yes, that's a great question, Allison, and I'd love to ask you the same about Wobot. Um, <laughs> for, for us, you know, my mission is really about business transformation, and that's digital transformation, that's workforce transformation, which includes a cultural transformation. Um, we do that through engagement of all stakeholders. 
part of it is just education. We have to show people how to embrace technology, how to not be afraid of artificial intelligence, how it can be used to um, create decision-making tools, decision support tools, and augment the workforce, not necessarily replace it, right? Um, so we, I guess if we have a call to action, it's all around democratizing innovation and bringing these new ideas and concepts to, to the, you know, the full circle of stakeholders. And that might include corporations like Microsoft and Google and Apple. Um, it also includes startups who are trying to break into this space. Um, it includes obviously our, our workforce and our community as well. And then we work quite a, quite a bit with uh, educational institutions. We want the younger generations to be thinking about this and be attracted to healthcare and realize you can be a doctor or a nurse, but you can also be a data informaticist or a, um, you know, in my case, kind of business transformation specialist or economist. There's so many opportunities mm -hmm. in healthcare that are kind of business focused. Um, mm -hmm. And so we come in with a business mindset to focus on democratizing access to all of this. So it sounds like I'm hearing like strong, really strong teams. I love first of all that you that you start with the mission because I think that's right, right? It, having a, a really strong mission is an organizing principle in and of itself. And then I'm hearing like a lot of um, themes around collaboration with key stakeholders, but also the broader community, um, education, engagement. Um, you know, this is this is amazing because I again, this is I think these are the sort of structural components that come together to enable innovation to sort of take place and ideas to flow. Um, where do you think the biggest problems are in healthcare at the moment? Like, where do you see there being the the largest gaps or the most urgent um, things that we should be going after fixing? Yes, well, it's no secret that there's a workforce shortage. We're short thousands of nurses in North Carolina. I think there's a 40% nurse shortage across the state. So that impacts us gravely. It impacts patient care and your patient experience and probably your patient outcome as well. Um, so we look for ways to, you know, innovative ways to get the next generation of workers into the pipeline. So we might start a program hiring veterans, right, who can, um, maybe they were a, a combat medic or an EMT or a, Air Force Special Operations Parajumper, and they can transition pretty easily to a healthcare job. Um, but we also look at robotic process automation in any kind, any ways to kind of support the workforce that we do have through artificial intelligence. Um, you know, and and there are various tools for that, and um, you know that might also include. It, Robot, right? So if we only have 13 behavioral health workers per 100,000 citizens, we cannot provide all the mental health care that's needed. Um, somewhere close to like 40% of adult population has some serious mental health care issue um, in their lifetime. One in five adults, one in five kids. So we don't have that workforce. So what can we do with automation or artificial intelligence or other interventions um, to support our, the workforce that we do have. Um, so robotic process automation and workforce optimization. We're also focused on virtual care and care expansion outside of the hospital. So that might be preventative wellness, like what are the wearable devices you can wear to help you understand your performance um, or your weight loss or your nutrition. But also what, what could you wear to do chronic disease management so you don't have to come into the hospital. So taking your glucose every day is less painful if you're a child with diabetes. Um, and then, you know, how can we extend our clinicians to rural communities via telehealth and other tools we can put on? Maybe somebody who's skilled at a lower level, um, but we need them to access mm -hmm. somebody with 10 more years of you know, medical education. Mm -hmm. um, so we might be using cameras for that or augmented reality or 5G technology. Um, so those are a couple of different spaces. I will say it's also a, a big priority for us to focus on mental health and mm -hmm. um, creative ways to support the needs in our community. Well, I'd love to dig in there a bit. And I love how you how you talk about process automation and not sort of, it's not about people automation and it's not about people replacement, which of course, you know, as ha having created Wobot, we hear a lot that, oh, you know, you're, you're replacing therapists and things. And it's of course, sure, th there's no therapist <laughs> to replace, right? That's not the issue. And, that, and there's a lot of automation that can be introduced that actually has its benefits. But I'd love to hear about your your thoughts on on mental health and um in particular like how do you see that virtual and digital space evolving 
um, inside of mental health systems? Like, how do you think about that? Well, I know it's been a priority for us. We've spent the last two years, I've been at Navant two and a half years, um, and I, the entire time we've been looking for digital front doors, um, mm-hmm. innovative tools, and ways to you know provide the, the bridge um, until we can get you in to see a therapist if you need it. Um, I, I've personally engaged with our public school system. We have, you know, my son alone had four kids at his school commit suicide. Um, at his high school and and he didn't know any of them too personally he did have class with some but it still affected him and the school school doesn't have the resources to support those teenagers right and uh, and so we just started looking we know on health innovation lab we're like this is a problem in our community it's affecting us personally as families it's affecting our workforce because they have kids in these schools or children who are going through challenges Um, our you know our behavior health therapists are in high demand so they're like everyone experiencing a bit of burnout right now. And so what kind of um, online tools could serve as that bridge? Could it be a chat bot that frankly, my teenager is more comfortable talking to AI and playing video games than he is sitting down and, and talking to me face to face or talking to someone else. So let's lean into that. Let's gamify rehab. Let's mm-hmm. um, find ways to take advantage of the tools that people are very comfortable using already. Um, And then, you know, we need to understand community cultural competencies, I should say. Mm -hmm. So my experience as a former military officer is different from yours as an academic at Stanford, right? And so, you you know, I I experienced different things when I was deployed that that you might not have. And you experienced different Mm -hmm. things in California that I I might not have. So we're probably going to need somebody who understands our personal experiences. And so, you know, we're even Mm -hmm. training our workforce in cultural competency for dealing with a female military veteran who might have experienced sexual assault, you know, or some of these other traumas. She's been shot at. She's been around toxic burn pits. And unless you understand the, where the person is coming from, I think it's difficult to provide the right intervention. So, you know, there's no one size fits all. We're looking at lots of mm-hmm. full spectrum of um, innovations in this space. You know what you're like. What you're describing is um, there is empathy, right? Understanding somebody's like being able to step into the shoes of somebody's real lived experience and um, and starting from that place. That's that's so important. Um, gosh, I, that's a very scary. You know, you don't even need to see the big data to understand that four suicides among young people in one high school is yeah. is very frightening. And it reminds me of when I when I joined Stanford, there were um, a lot of um, there was a cluster of suicides there in Palo Alto as well. And um, one of my uh, colleagues, Shashank Joshi, led a, a, an amazing program where they they really um, sought to understand what was happening. Um, and and the solution ended up being, well, I say solution, but the the strategy to reduce and to ultimately to kind of um, remove more suicidal events was to understand things like um, just the broad field of stakeholders that the the things that these kids and their parents and their families in the broader community are coming into contact with mm-hmm. every day that actually either increases the risk of another kind of suicide occurring or decreases it and sort of going at it from this i just remember thinking wow that is such a holistic approach and it ended up being really effective um and I think often a lot of the the best tactics we have are these very grassroots, community driven, you know, cohesive um, global initiatives. So, um, and and that's what I'm hearing. You 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 talk about all of the key stakeholders and understanding the different perspectives and harnessing that and bringing it together. So that's amazing. So I also I want to remind folks because we're having this wonderful conversation. Please press the Q and A button um, to to ask Paula um, some questions, which will queue up at the end. Um, you mentioned women in the military. I wonder if I could change tack a little bit. And I was I was kind of reflecting on this earlier. I wonder, I know that um, sort of uh, women's empowerment is something that's close to your heart as well. And you have a teenage son. Um, I'm wondering if you thought about, say, um, somebody who is 18 years old now, you know, just emerging from their primary, you know, from, from education, from high school, um what ways in which what ways do you feel like the world is different for them now than it would have been for for you or me um and you know where do you see it progressing also where do we need to kind of are there ways in which we need to you know help empower 
um, these these young women um, and young men, of course. But I'm curious from your perspective, having just had this incredible career in in a fairly, I think it's safe to say, male traditionally male dominated place. Yeah, I think you know one of my frustrations, having grown up in the military, if you will, um, where I was, I think we were eight percent of the population at the U.S. Military Academy. Now it's higher, but. Um, I'd grown up with brothers, so I was used to being kind of pushed Me too. around and Three brothers. <laughs> having to fight and stand up for myself and run really fast to get away and punch back. And, you know, I learned to defend myself. It wasn't, didn't feel that unusual going to West Point. But when I realized I couldn't be the very top of the, of the military uh, because women weren't allowed in combat and therefore you couldn't be, have served in a position that would get you to be a four star overall the military. I'm like, well, that's not fair. I can run faster than him. I can shoot better than him. I can do all the military tactics that is re- are required of me and fast. In fact, I'm like top 1% of the class. So I didn't understand that. And that was the first time I was like, what is this bias thing? I never, I never understood it. Right. I grew up on a cattle ranch where everybody worked, everybody was equal. And um, yeah. so it, it was once I realized I couldn't be all I could be, which was the army's motto, ironically. Um, oh, yes. I decided I've got to help break those um, brass ceilings for the next generation of women in the military. And so I just, you know, I personally campaigned for doors to be open and, and used myself and showed other women who had met the standards, exceeded the standards, you know, got, got an A plus on the men's scale. Like we were holding ourselves to the same scale as men. And, and so, you know, I would encourage young women to, um, who, who might feel frustrated by a barrier or a challenge to mm-hmm. find a mentor. I, you know, this is coming back to, I didn't have a mentor once I realized that was a challenge. Um, not a female or male mentor. For, for men, they were cautious of, you know, mentoring young women in the military, and there were many senior women around at that point. Um, mm. So find a mentor who can help you f- figure out the way forward, right? There are teens these days, I think, face so much pressure from social media that's contributing right. to depression, anxiety, anorexia, you know, eating disorders, and and so my, fortunately, my boys are just not interested in social media. They don't compare themselves to others. I wish they cared a little bit more That's about great. Them. <laughs> yes, but um, I also think they're part of the solution. And, you know, they, they, mm. they look for female friends who um, it's more about their character than, than their look. And, and, you know, they value mm. brains as much as anything else. And, so it, it's encouraging women to feel empowered and that they can break through those brass ceilings and encouraging young men to respect them and enable them and empower them. So it's very, it's not technology. It's not, it's simple yes. empathy. I mean, back to um, your original point. I love that. I, I, have, did your boys just grow up like that or that, that would, they were values that you actively taught them? I also have, I have a three-year-old boy, so this is oh, ahead okay. of me. <laughs> Yes, yes. Well, they, um, you know, they see, they have a strong role model, I think, in, in yes, me. Yes, of course. And um, I, you know, we live in the South, so being polite and respectful is, is very much inculcated in, in all of us in the South. Um, I think sometimes they, they feel challenged too. It's, it's ironic, Allison, I suppose we're a little off topic, but I've fought so hard for women's empowerment. And now I'm seeing my, my young white male boys are, you know, not getting opportunities. It's sort of ironic and a different topic, but um, I, I always tell them, you be the best version of you. You show up, you do the best you can. You're an ambassador for our family. Um, mm. And, you know, if you feel like you're facing a barrier, you know, you need to list the reasons why and show them they're wrong and, and prove that you can do whatever is expected of you. So, um, but, you know, they, I do think I, um, one of my best friends has a teen daughter. She's right sandwiched in between my boys and they're like, cousins and I see her facing very different challenges than, than my teen boys but um yeah. but my boys have struggled with mental health too and yeah. and I think teaching anyone at that age to be able to communicate is the most important thing we can do that's right I I, I um you know not not to put a plug in here for Woba but I, I agree with you um one of the things that we found which we had a feedback from a clinician who was working with Wobot that said that Wobot was teaching young people um, how to express themselves and in sort of basic communication back and forth because they're, 
because a, a lot of teens are not necessarily getting that training um, in the same way that maybe you and I had when in you know growing up. So that is very interesting. Um, well, so I, we're getting some wonderful questions in here. Um, I before we switch over to those, I just want to remind folks if you can just um, let us know where what your name is and and where you're um, where you're coming from, where you're listening from. Um, but the one last question I wanted to say um, I wanted to ask you before we go there is if you have the power to change one thing about healthcare, um, what would you do? I would try to find a way to destigmatize the need for one to, to, to seek. We, we can find access. There are these innovative tools out there, but, um, you know, even in my experience in the military as an intelligence officer, I would have lost my clearance had I sought out psychological help for something. And that's just, wow. you know, and, wow. and what's taught to you in the military is to be a warrior, suck it up, like carry on. You can't let, you know, now, that's taught me resilience and grit, mm. it's, and that same spirit has helped me get through the toughest things in life, but, um, you know, I, I had a personal experience with major depression a couple of years ago, and I was, I just couldn't dig out of it. As strong and as resilient as I still think I am, I realized I needed outside intervention, and so destigmatizing that and mm -hmm. making, you know, from a young age, it's okay to talk to mom, it's okay to talk to uncle or friend, um, you know, it would be the, the key thing, but gosh, Allison, I don't know how we do that. I is I look. I love that, Paula. I I agree with you completely. I think when we talk about access, like I believe that stigma is the key thing that actually is the access issue we need to solve. But so much of what you're talking about, you know, this idea that um that somehow experiencing a mental health episode or struggle like a depression is not the same thing as strength. I just wonder. You know, and people say I'm kind of resilient and strong in spite of that. I wonder if lots of people are resilient and strong because of them, you know, that they're actually hand in hand, uh, you know, and I see that again and again. And um, But I so I just I love your insight. I love your perspective. So as much as I would love to continue to talk to you, let me ask you a few questions, because I think we have some people chomping at the bit here to to hear from you. Um, so I have a great question from Sarah. Um, she's a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Southern California. Um, her selected project is to implement digital health and pharma uh, doctoral education. Um, my question may be a bit out of the webinar scope, but I want to put your look. We've been all over the place in this webinar, so I don't think it's too out of scope. But I want to know more information um, on how to build a bridge between pharmacy programs in the US and innovative companies who create apps like Wobot. Is there a method to bring demonstrations to our faculty members and students? The aim is to prepare future pharmacy students for this new revolution in healthcare. I'm happy to get, oh, that's amazing. So I will, um, I can reach out to you, Sarah, as well, because we're always happy to do talks. But I think the broad theme of how do we treat, how do we train the next generation of clinicians and healthcare workers um, in innovation is a really, really great one. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I'll just add a little bit of, of context or flavor to that. So, you know, when I came to Navant two and a half years ago, nobody had really tried virtual or augmented reality. So we had to take it to them during COVID, which was pretty challenging, or show on a Zoom call, the experience is very different. It, you know, you can't understand that immersive training and education. You can't understand how augmented reality glasses, which you can see the room um, and you can scan them you know, a pill bottle and the QR code and verify it's the right medication. If this is a nurse wearing it, right medication, right dose, right person you're giving it to. You, you can't explain that. It's probably not even making sense to you now. You have to see it and try it. So there has yes. to be this tactile exposure. So bringing, you know, um, to Sarah, if you have an innovation team at USC or you want to call us over at Navant Health. We, when I say democratizing innovation, I'm talking to people in Korea and Israel and California, um, you know, anyone who wants to understand what's going on in this healthcare space that we're looking at, you know, we, we want to provide that access to all, but I'm sure you have some, some local resources and for your students, it's really about the exposure. Wouldn't you agree, Alison? Absolutely. I just think the, the, the more experiences, understanding that things are out there and open-mindedness, right? Knowing 
things are shifting and things need to shift and that's okay that's a good thing I think we hear in mental health in particular um people have this sometimes this sense of like that's the way therapy is and the way it can only be practiced and in fact the field of psychotherapy is so early it's in its infancy and you know um it's it's going to shift and shift in really good ways um so I have another really great question here and this person didn't leave their name unfortunately but um how do we make health systems make mental well-being more accessible for healthcare frontline members and so i know you mentioned this earlier so it's a good yeah time. this is a great question i mean you know we have forty thousand employees and we have a lot of uh, workforce burnout um so we have actually created position at novant's called team member well-being it's a senior vice president role and they work with our chaplains um they go out to our field workers if you will um, and by the way, one in healthcare workers will see an average of 15 deaths a year. 15. They observe, they, they interact with that person. Oh my goodness. I, I've seen a few deaths. I've lost friends in war and one is, is enough to kind of mm-hmm. see, I'm even getting emotional now. So we are, we take that very seriously. We have, um, we have various apps we offer. We have respite rooms. We have VR experiences. We have other perks as an employee you can take advantage of and, in hotlines we've lost some employees to suicide so it's mm-hmm. um you know it's i think it's a priority for most healthcare systems definitely ours do you think it's changing i think it feels like we're so much more cognizant now of this right and I, and, I, and i'm really heartened by there's there's so many health systems that are really driven to look after their people who have been on the front lines for a couple of years the mental health or health workers um so i think yeah hopefully plenty of um cause for optimism there another quick question in the last three minutes um these are so great so i'm trying to squeeze in as many as i possibly can but um tips on how you help share or sell the concept of rpa and other virtual digital tech internally when it seems to uh, seems to many as talking to humans work away as taking humans work oh sorry that when it seems to many as taking human work away Yes, I think um, there's a stigma there as well. Well, I, I would say it's again show and tell. So in our innovation lab, we mm-hmm. have um, a model uh, ICU room and we have different technologies we're plugging in there so that our workforce can come in and try it. And some of it is robotic process automation. For example, a voice to text talk. So if a clinician is interviewing somebody and um, that patient is talking and those notes get collected and the AI system will say, okay, Paula mentioned these things. She does its little algorithm. It's like, she probably has this disease or this injury and here's the insurance code that goes with it. And here's, you know, recommended course of action. The doctor or nurse still has to validate all of that. Hmm. But what it does is it saves that doctor and nurse from going home at night and spending three hours. And most of my physician friends have to do this. They go home at night and they're like, what was, what was Allison's problem at 8 a.m. when I saw her at 8? I think she said it was her right knee. Maybe it was her left knee. So, you, so if you show them that it makes their job easier, I think they're, yeah. they're not afraid of, of using something like that. I love that. And, and this isn't, I mean... Just from from our point of view, I think these conversations are so important. The, the sort of narrative around sort of AI taking jobs is it actually ends up obscuring the conversations that we should be having, like this one. So, yeah. um, I, one last question: um, Chris Hemphill, one of my favorite people, asks: Are there innovations or healthcare pathways that focus specifically on the needs of veterans or service people? Chris, I'm I'm happy to give you a. a lengthy list of resources for veterans. Maybe Allison can connect us. Um, mm-hmm. uh, there, there are lots of resources in my community specifically, and I think that's back to like culturally competent. My community here, I know the veteran support groups. I trust them. It's not somebody who's going to you know, not respond to me when I be, allow myself to be vulnerable. Uh, but there, mm-hmm. the Wounded Warrior Project, um, USOs have chapters in every state. Um, we have a group in North Carolina called Veteran Veteran Bridge Home, and they're helping veterans transition to the civilian world, which in and of itself is a is a very frustrating experience because you don't speak the same language as, as the civilian world. But um, thankfully, a lot of resources out there, and specifically some focused on on women. Our experience were different than guys, right? So happy to provide those offline. I love that. Paula, sadly, we are out of time, but I want to thank you so much for what it was an incredibly illuminating conversation. Um, and I'm sure all our listeners are, are thrilled as well. So thank you so much. 
Thanks, Allison. Appreciate it. And uh, thanks for all you're doing with Wobot. Keep up the great work. Thanks for all you're doing. And indeed, <laughs> I hope to talk to you again.